yeah, so I take some time to breathe. I need that. I'm a little bit excited. Kempola, here. First, please. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, welcome to this evening. Herzlich willkommen. Welcome, everybody's here. It's beautiful to see everybody. Uh, my name is Michael, and I can just give some short organization information, and then we're here for the evening, of course. And at the end, I will give you some more information, yeah, maybe for another event tomorrow and the next days. So welcome here in this room in Nuremberg and welcome live in stream in worldwide. I don't know where people are sitting in front of their laptops, but that's a hybrid event. So welcome everywhere. And um, it's really wonderful that we meet again. Have a look around and see in these faces. I'm really happy to stand here to have a microphone and to see all of you. And um, I really just have this short information about this evening. We will have a panel discussion. I hope you know what's yeah, the, for which event you're right now here. It's from six till eight o'clock. Yeah, and at eight o'clock we have a pause for half an hour. In this half an hour, if you want to, we we can offer a bottle of water, of course. Um, if if you go out, so it's also from from this side the museum. It's closed. They don't have a catering this evening. Sorry for that. But um, yeah, have a 30 minute break from 8 till 8.30 and then we show a wonderful film and we even have the director of the film here, maybe Paul, please stand up for us, yeah, he's <laughs> wondering, wondering but not lost, we will show this like in a cinema from 8.30 till 10 o'clock and we are happy when most of you really stay till the end. That's it from my side. Um, that's a wonderful co-production and I'm happy that in a short moment our yeah, four chairs will be seated. So from my side, thank you. And on behalf of Tiger Germany and of Mind and Life, let's have a wonderful evening and yeah, happy to see you. Thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, nice to see all of you for this uh, very special occasion um, here in Nuremberg in the Germanischen Nationalmuseum and uh, on a discussion on the natural qualities of the mind. And this is a very special occasion for various reasons. First of all, it's one our first uh, live event that we are able to host uh, here in Germany for quite some time, so it's wonderful to gather here in person. Uh, it's also a special occasion because we have a hybrid uh, event, so we have uh, uh, also participants joining us online, uh, which is wonderful. And it's also the first occasion where Uh, Mind and Life Europe and uh, the Turga meditation community in Germany are co-hosting an event. Uh, so maybe just a, a couple of words to these two organizations for those of you not familiar. So Mind and Life uh, Europe is an uh, uh, organization, Mind and Life, being dedicated uh, to the dialogue between uh, Western scientists and uh, the contemplative tradition to bring together these uh, two approaches of uh, investigating what mind and 
and what life is, what we are doing here. Uh, founded uh, about 35 years ago by His Holiness Dalai Lama and uh, Francesco Varela and many other uh, uh, scientists. The Tiger Meditation Community was founded uh, by Minga Rinpoche, which is the head of uh, this meditation community, uh, which whom I will introduce a little bit later. Uh, so this is a really, really wonderful occasion for us to come together. Also, a warm welcome to uh, those present uh, online and all of here present in person. Now, coming to... Uh, my name is Holger Jesche, so I'm a member of Man Life Europe and also uh, a facilitator in the Targa Meditation community. And I'm uh, very happy to introduce uh, the members here on stage, uh, which, first of all, uh, Minge um, uh, our uh, dear teacher in the Targa Meditation community, um, born in Nepal. Uh, has been teaching meditation extensively for the last 20 years. Uh, uh, author of uh, many books, his newest book being uh, In Love with the World, uh, uh, where uh, Rumbichi describes his experience during his wandering retreat, um, uh, very moving, and of course his first book being The Joy of Living, which uh, brought together uh, in, in, in one book this, co uh, this, this um, merging together of the Western and the Eastern traditions. Uh, then, so welcome Rumbichi. Then we have uh, Marie van der Vogt, uh, and here I have to um, refer to, to my notes. Uh, so Marike is an assistant professor uh, in the Bernoulli Institute of Mathematics, Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence at the University of Groningen and obtained a PhD in the Un University of Pennsylvania and then a postdoc in Princeton University and now in her lab in uh, Groningen. And her research, research aims to understand how, when and why we mind wonder. Uh, fascinated by how this mind-wandering process is adaptive, as in the case of creativity, when it becomes maladaptive, as in the case of uh, depressive rumination. And we have, so welcome, uh, Marike. Thank you for, for being here. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have Dr. Antoine Lutz uh, from uh, uh, Antoine Lutz obtained his PhD in the uh, cognitive neuroscience in Paris under Francesco Varela, uh, where he used the neurophenomenological approach to study the neurocorrelates of attention and perception. He worked uh, with Richie Davidson in the uh, University of Wisconsin, and uh, where one of the major researchers 20 years ago compared uh, the differences between expert meditators and novice me meditators. And now um, in the Neuro uh, Lyon Neuroscience Research Center, where his current research group focuses on the neurophenomenology of mindfulness and compassion, meditations, and on the impact of these practices on consciousness, attention, and emotion regulation. So, We um, have, um, the, the evening will flow as follows. So we have some initial um, uh, notes from uh, Minga Rinpoche on the qualities, the natural qualities of the mind. After which then uh, uh, Marike and Antoine will share uh, their new research, their new studies. And this would be interwoven in some exchange uh, between uh, the three. Then there will be a, a, a period of uh, questions uh, being able to be asked, so if you have any questions during that time. And then we will conclude with uh, Minga Rinpoche guiding us in some uh, practices. So um, on that note, I would like to hand uh, the word to you, Minga uh, to tell us about, from your perspective, on the natural qualities of the mind. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so from the uh, Buddhist, the meditation aspect, what we call the, the natural quality of the mind, or sometimes what we call the definition of the mind, is clear and knowing. So, can you see my hand? So that is a clarity. But that clarity, clarity or knowing 
has two aspects, what we call self-clarity or self-luminosity or illuminating others. So illuminating others meaning when I ask you, can you see my hand through eyes, of course, you can see that. So that means our mind perceives the image of my hand, knows that is hand, and there's a feeling comes also. So there's a thinking, feeling, and that register in the subconscious mind, sometimes what we call volition. Volition has two aspects, and that become kind of like um, subconscious or unconscious or habitual mind. So, but essence of all this mind is what we call self-clarity, self-luminosity. And that is the, for example, when we, if there's a lamp, flame, the flame has two qualities. One, if you leave the lamp, in the dark room, then things around lamp can be visible, right? Because of the lamp. So that's an example of illuminating others. So if there's a cup, if there's a table, if there's a pizza, maybe beer, you know. so whatever things around can be visible by this flame. So now here, you can see me, you can hear me, and then might be smell or that some, if you're eating something, there's a taste, then there's sensation in the body. And there's a feeling in the mind. Then we are thinking about that. Then this feeling and thinking registers something in the subconscious mind. So all these are illuminating others. It has to have object. If there's an object, then there's subject. So two things, subject and object. The flame and the cup has to have two things. Now the second one, the self-luminosity or self-clarity, you don't need to have object. If there's no object, then there's no subject because subject and object is depending each other, right? No, no object, then what is subject? So, illuminated by itself, like flame. So, for example, this stick cannot illuminate by itself. It has to have another light. Light from electricity, light from sun, flame, or something. So, this is no light. But the flame, illuminated by itself, so these two things are different phenomena. So sometimes when we think the mind illuminates itself, then we think, we think about the mind. You don't need to think about mind. You need to feel mind, not necessary to feel about the mind. So there's no need to have any subject and object being mind itself is clarity, luminosity, awareness. So sometimes there's an argument. Your face cannot see your face. The knife, very sharp, cannot cut by itself. Yes, for example, stick cannot illuminate by itself. For that case, yes. But another example, flame can illuminate by itself. The flame is the light. So special quality of the mind the fundamental quality of the mind is the self-luminosity, self-clarity. So how to connect with that self-luminosity, self-clarity is the oldest part, practice, step-by-step -step practice. And, um, and when we connect with the self-luminosity, self-clarity, more and more for us, what we call, there's a more freedom, more pliable, more happiness, liberation comes. But of course, at the beginning, it's very difficult. So what we for us, the example of the fundamental quality of the mind is like sky in, in, the, in the mountain. 
So that's the first time I learned meditation when I was nine years old from my father due to panic attacks. I had panic attacks. So my father said, don't try to fight with the panic. You don't have to do anything with the panic. Let panic come, let panic go. Why? Fundamental level, panic cannot change the natural quality of the mind. So the fundamental quality of the mind is always pure, present, beyond, and calm, just like sky in the mountain. So sky in the mountain, in the Himalaya mountains, sometime very nice blue sky with the sun, sun shining, but some days there's a, a storm comes. And the storm in the Himalayan mountain is terrible, you know, the snowstorm. The wind comes, snow go up, down, right, left, every direction. I think in Germany only come down, right? <laughs> snow not go up. And thun thunderstorm in the summer, terrible. The lightning and then make very loud noise in the mountain because the echo and the a lot of light, sometimes cut trees and, you know, uh, smash the rocks. And my father said, no matter how much this storm comes, cannot change the nature of sky. So the fundamental quality of our mind cannot change by thought, emotion, feeling, all this. But the problem is we are lost with thought, emotion, feeling. We don't see the fundamental quality of mind. So, how to connect with the fundamental quality of mind? Normally, the practice what we call three things, view, meditation, application. So view, first you recognize what is the fundamental quality of mind, and special you need to recognize awareness. And the meditation, the first step is what we call to see sky, you can see through cloud. Because to see sky at the beginning is very difficult, right? You cannot really see. What do you see? Can you see sky? Yes. What did you see? Nothing to see, right? <laughs> but you can see sky, cloud. So through cloud, you can connect to the sky. So we can connect to our fundamental quality of the mind through form, sound, smell, touch, sensation, thought, emotion. Everything can be support for awareness, support for clarity, support for luminosity. Then, next step, what we call open awareness meditation. Rest mind as it is without any particular support, no object. So by doing that, what happened? Uh, normally what we call this uh, three things. The first is everything becomes support. Everything becomes friend. So I practiced that when I was nine with my panic. And when I was 13, Panic become my, my friend, my teacher, support for meditation. Just like breathing. At the beginning, we meditate on the breathing, breathing in, breathing out. And then slowly we can meditate on the thought. Thought comes, thought goes, emotion comes, then panic. In the end, we see panic. When we see panic, that means we are out of panic. When we see the river, that means we are out of river. So awareness becomes bigger than panic. Panic is just an object. So everything becomes friend. Second, what we call our mind become pliable and walkable. I think these two great scientists, they will talk about that. So normally our mind doesn't have freedom, right? Mind does opposite. Don't think about the beer garden. What happened? <laughs> we will think about beer garden. Today I went to beer garden <laughs> in the mountain, mm -hmm. but uh, I cannot drink beer, so I eat cheese. <laughs> <laughs> so many cheeses, <laughs> so many dishes, but all dishes are made by cheese. I thought this is the same as my teaching. <laughs> so normal, I teach a variety type of meditation techniques, but all are in awareness. So. A <laughs> lot of dish all are in the cheese. So meditation technique, same thing. In the end, everything is awareness. <laughs> so, but 
pliable, walkable meaning, you can guide your mind. When you want to think, you can think. When you don't want to think, you can you don't need to think. When you want to rest, you can rest. When you, go, when you want to explore nature reality, you can explore. So number three. So number three is to really uh, discover our fundamental quality, our basic innate goodness, our true nature. So these three come together, sometimes what we call liberation, nirvana, enlightenment in the end. So I think I will uh, conclude here. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you, Matrim Bache, for uh, these wonderful reflections on the natural qualities of the mind. And I would like to now pass on to, to Marike van der Voep to uh, uh, present us with your research. Thank you so much. Um, so this is quite, uh, it feels very mundane to, <laughs> to then start talking about how we study the natural qualities of the mind in the lab. Uh, but anyway, I will give it a go. Um, so, as uh, Holger Yesho already mentioned, uh, a large part of the work in my lab is about mind wandering. And so, probably when you ask a scientist, um, a, a neuroscientist or a, psychology, what a psychologist, what is the natural quality of the mind, they will tell you something like mind wandering, because that's what happens uh, when you you ask a random person, um, uh, you don't do anything to them, uh, you ask them what, what's going on in your mind, they, they are, say they're mind wandering or daydreaming or something like that. And in fact, that's what we do about half of the time. Um, so if you give people a task and you literally ask them like once a minute, roughly, um, what were you thinking about, then half of the time the answer is um, daydreaming or something of to that extent and not the task. And it's not even about how boring the task is. Many tasks that we do in the lab are quite boring, I have to admit that, but even with more difficult tasks we do find that. Um, you also find it from the following procedure where you put people in the scanner and you let them do nothing. Now, of course, people never do nothing. Um, so what they will do is start to think and mind wander. Um, so that's what we see. And we also see a particular network in the brain uh, pop up. That's called the default mode network. So it's a bunch of areas along the midline of the brain. Um, Antoine will say more about it um, later. Um, but they tend to become more active when people are mind wandering. Um, we also, in my lab, we don't uh, stick people in the scanner a lot. We mostly actually have them do tasks on a computer. So one of the tasks we really love to do is what's called the sustained attention to response task. So that's an example of a very boring task. Literally what happens is what you see here on the screen. Um, they see a digit um, once, a, um, um, once a second or so, and they have to press the button whenever they see a digit, except when it's the number three. So here, the, um, not all of the digits are called non-targets, so they have to press the buttons, and then the three is special, so it's called a target, and that's where they have to not press the button. So this is a very um, uh, annoying task to do. You can imagine doing this for an hour, then, you know, um, you can, when you have people do this in the lab, um, you can regularly hear something like shoot, um, which is uh, when they accidentally uh, press the button to freeze. Um, so this happens very uh, quickly. Um, and Regularly, we then ask them, what were you thinking about? Um, <clears throat> and we give them multiple choice options, like uh, I was thinking about the task, I was thinking about how I was doing on the task, I was daydreaming, or I was um, thinking about other things. And then you can also ask them other questions, like, for example, here um, you can see how aware were you of where your attention was. Now, this turns out to be a very difficult question to answer for most people, so we actually don't use it in my lab. We tend to ask them more questions that are easier, like, um, how difficult was it to disengage from the thought? I find that a very interesting question, uh, which we will talk more about uh, later tonight as well because it, it, it 
tells you a little bit about how, how sticky the mind is. But you can also ask them about um, whether you, the thoughts were positive or negative, or whether they were self-related or other-related, and so on. So um, this gives you actually very rich data. And one of the things that you find is very simply if you didn't ask, um, what effect does it have on how, people, how well people do the task? On the left, uh, you can see two graphs, which um, sh if they're lower, then uh, people do worse when they're mind wandering. And you can see in two of the tasks that we, we tested, so one was the task I just showed you, another is another kind of boring task. <laughs> um, you can see in both cases, people do worse when they're mind wandering. You can also look at how fast do they perform the task. Um, here it depends a little bit on what kind of task you do, whether people speed up, and that's what you see in this um, sustained attention to response task, because people will just go mindlessly start to press the button. Um, but in other tasks, they might completely forget to press buttons, um, and that's where, why you see them actually, on average, slowing down and becoming more variable in their responses. So, Nevertheless, they tend to be worse at doing the tasks when they mind wander. So you might think, oh, it's all bad. And it can even get more worse, <laughs> if that's a word, um, because it uh, can turn into depressive rumination. And rumination is uh, defined as a process of narrowly focused, uncontrolled, repetitive thinking that's mostly negative in nature and mostly self-referential. And this is really a risk factor for diseases such as depression. Um, so, um, this is why we're quite interested in this in the lab. We also running clinical trials that investigate how um, does mindfulness, for example, um, or other kind of mental practices, how do they affect this rumination. Um, but just nevertheless, it's, it's, it's all I want to say in this is that Rumination is a particular case where mind wandering is really harmful because it can instigate um, problems like depression. And even the lighter form that we like to study in our lab, um, which, we, which I like to call sticky thinking, um, it's the kind of thinking that I um, get in response to this question of how difficult was it to disengage from the thought? How difficult was it to let go from the thought? When people say it was difficult, we actually see that they perform worse on the task right before that. And we see also that their brain responds less to incoming stimulus, uh, stimulation, their eyes respond less to sim incoming stimuli. So when you're in this sticky thought, you're really disconnected from the world. Um, so this is where mind wandering uh, is really harmful. Um, well, sticky thought is not really, really harmful, but not that adaptive either. Um, having said that, I also do want to emphasize that mind wandering is not at all bad. In fact, I often like to say that if you don't mind wander, I, I would get really worried. Um, I don't want, <laughs> I think then you become a robot or something like that. Um, so there are cases where mind wandering is adaptive. Um, so we've been studying planning in our lab. Um, I'm not going to talk more about that because it's very complex to study that. But um, a more easy to um, explain study was done by Ben Baird and colleagues where they looked at creativity. And that's another adaptive use of mind wandering. So um, mind wandering is just a free floating um, in its best form, it's a very free-floating uh, form of thought that allows you to think about other things, maybe create a solution. So um, the data you see here is from uh, a task called the unusual users task, where basically we give you something like a glass of water, and then you're asked to think about um, many different ways to use that glass of water. I mean, to quench your thirst maybe, but also maybe to wash your hair or um, um, uh, to um, entice uh, um, insects or, I don't know, uh, <laughs> coming up with many different ways to use a glass of water. Um, and um, when people are given the question about a glass of water twice, and in between they are um, given a period, um, then if, you have g if they are able to do mind wandering in that period, because they just uh, can do a very undemanding task, then actually they come up with many more um, different uses of the glass of water or the pen or whatever we give them than uh, when they don't have the opportunity to mind wander. For example, when they just go straight 
to do the task again or when they do a very difficult task so they don't have space to go out. So just want to make sure that everyone in this room realizes that mind wandering is not all bad, but it can be really bad if it's so sticky. Um, so summary, um, mind wandering according to mainstream cognitive neuroscience would be our mind's natural activity. Um, which is what we see when people are not given a task to do and it can be harmful when it takes up task resources um, and especially when it becomes so sticky that we cannot let it go and it just impairs everything uh, we do. Um, but it can also be helpful um, when it uh, can use the unused time to think up new solutions or plan. Now, how can we make our mind wandering more adaptive? So um, there is some data nowadays that shows that um, meditation can actually improve our performance on these tasks that measure mind wandering, which I call MW just for short. Um, so here we see data from a study that showed that um, after, um, on the left bar, um, after people do um, an um, mindfulness practice, which also has a component of acceptance of the thoughts, um, then they do much better on such a, uh, on this kind of a SART task that we were talking about. Um, then when they get another kind of control, they get relaxation training or uh, something else. So that's one way. But the other way that I actually want to talk about is there is very little research these days on other kind of practices that might also be helpful. So I started a couple of years ago to collaborate uh, with monks at Sarah J Monastery, which you see here in the picture, where um, rather than spending time um, meditating by themselves, most of their time, you can actually see them either memorizing scriptures or doing this. And they, it's, it's actually a fantastic sight. You see like literally hundreds of monks out there on the square debating each other. And um, when I saw this for the first time, I was like, I want to know what they're doing, what's going on in their mind, what's going on in their brain, and um, how does that affect their thinking? Um, so then we brought debate into the lab, so we're going to now see a little video if the technique goes well. So this is actually really scientific. <laughs> so they are wearing um, caps. <laughs> so nice. <laughs> And this looks still very uh, leisurely, but we're now going to switch to the end of the video a little later, and you can see they get quite excited. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so you can pause the video now. Um, yeah, so th this looks like they're going to be fighting and attacking each other, but actually the very cool thing um, to note about this is that two seconds later, they're going to be joking and being friends again. You can see them really, I, I would call that as a scientist, a lot of mental flexibility, and I think that's what also really interested me. Like, what, what are they learning here? that allows them this mental flexibility and, and what, what are they doing? Because as it turns out, when I learned more, they, they have some very disciplined structure of what they're talking about. It looks quite chaotic, but actually there's a lot of structure going on here. Um, and also what's going on in their brain. Um, so that's why they're wearing these um, electrode caps. Um, so we uh, recorded data from 
I don't know, 50 or so um, monks as they were debating. And um, now we can move to the next, uh, oh, I can move to the next slide. <laughs> I am actually in control. Um, and we, we looked at their brain waves and we looked in particular at the brain wave that's a little bit in front here. That's what this circle on the bottom of the screen shows. It's an electrode on the frontal midline and during um, um, like mindfulness meditation practices or focused attention practices, what you tend to see is an increase in the brain waves um, of the, what are called the theta uh, bands, which are thought to reflect something like um, attention and really focus, a very strong focus. So what was interesting is that the monks, especially the very experienced monks, they showed a very strong increase in these theta waves over the course of the debate. So in the beginning, they were still maybe also a little nervous because we were watching them and they had these backpacks <laughs> with <laughs> electrodes on them. Um, but then as they got in the debate, they completely forgot everything around them and, and you could see that in their brains. And that was more so for what they call the logic debates, where they really went into um, very precise logic compared to count what they call counting debates, which is more like repeating um, the, the structure of the scriptures or um, citations and stuff like that, which they find easier. Um, so, um, and, and uh, here you can see that the, the blue is the more experienced monks and uh, the red are the more beginner monks. So that's just a little bit of what we did. We also are currently working on a study of emotions um, in collaboration with the monks who are, by the way, becoming also amazing scientific experts. So we're teaching them about science by being involved in this uh, scientific collaboration. So they've been fantastic at, um, during the pandemic, um, running questionnaire studies um, on the other monks in the monastery. And um, one of the things we found is that the more experienced monks on the right um, have lower negative effects, uh, negative emotions, than the less experienced monks. And this was um, especially during the pandemic. So we have a lot to research there and also better control groups. I know all of that. But you know, I think it's some really interesting data from the beginning. So that's um, where I want to end. So um, meditation practices, I think, can help people to manage their mind wandering to make it more adaptive. Um, but maybe analytical meditation would be another option. We haven't directly looked at mind wandering yet um, in that context. Um, because doing tasks with Tibetan monks is another story. Um, <laughs> it's, it's quite a learning process for everyone. Maybe Rinpoche can also, <laughs> he's been a participant in some of the research, I think, so maybe you can also share what that's like. Um, we did find increases in midfrontal theta waves, uh, which might reflect his ability to really um, focus and um, gets absorbed, um, similar to other meditation practices, and we saw a reduction in negative emotions. Um, so yeah, that's all I wanted to share. Um, thanks a lot. <laughs> Thank you, Marike. And I just want to invite either Antoine or Rinpoche to, if there's any, any comments on uh, what we've just heard. Um, yeah. The meditation, there's one, normally, I think now, especially in the West, what we call mindfulness is just being, so one of the meditation technique. Mm -hmm. But uh, wha while I'm listening to you, there's another meditation. One is analytical meditation. That means you have to think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And special debate, you have to think with the really uh, like critical and uh, creative and different ways. So sometimes what we call, we have monkey mind. But monkey mind is not good, not bad. It depends on your relationship. Mm. If you become Uncontrollable, under controlled by monkey mind, then monkey mind become quite uh, negative. But if you become friend with the monkey mind, and monkey mind become your, you guide the monkey mind, and monkey mind which is good. So I was mm -hmm. just thinking about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very, yeah. very much. Wonderful presentation.
Thank you, Jay. Yeah, and it's really interesting that there is now some ideas out there also in the mind-wandering literature that say, well, maybe true mind-wandering is one where you're completely unbiased by anything. You can just freely float anywhere, but you're not uncontrollable. You're free of constraints is what they call it. So it's a, you know, also, even in scientific literature, we see, yeah. I think, similar ideas. What, what I found very interesting in uh, terms of the aspect of creativity uh, that you also um, uh, kind of tuned in on, and then what Rinpoche just mentioned about in debate, when we actually have this creativity aspect in our mind, this mm -hmm. openness, that we can actually think outside of the box mm -hmm. and find different ways of actually yeah. using this analytical uh, capacity of the mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's when w we need to be not sticky in our minds. That's the only way we can do that. And of course, I think debate is quite interesting because as far as I've heard is they are taught by their teacher, like during the debate, that's the only moment in the day where they're actually encouraged to be proud and arrogant and tease each other so that they can train at even when, you know, they're made fun of, um, they, they are not going into the sticky ruminative mind, which is, yeah. you know, the moment you ask a person to think about themselves, we can, we've done that experiment, that's where the sticky mind comes in. What, what we call it in the monastery, sometimes there's a ritual style of monastery, they don't do debate much, uh -huh. but the monastery where they do debate actually become more friendly. Oh. The monks have become more really uh, respect each other more. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe Mike, a quick question. What I found really fascinating with your work, which is really unique in our field, is that most of the work on meditation in the West has focused on, on um, practice when you do, you sit, you sit, and it's more you with your own mind. And uh, there are two aspects that I found really interesting with this style of practice, is that you do it as a dyad, mm -hmm. so two person, mm -hmm. which may be a way actually to regulate my wandering because... Uh, the other is a way to, you don't, can't get lost in your own mind because the other is here. Mm. So it's maybe a, a, an implicit way to regulate your mind through the interaction with the other. Yeah. And so you can engage with thoughts without being lost because the other is here to bring you back. So it's an interesting uh, yeah. maybe way to regulate mind wandering, to learn to do it. Yeah. And the other one is the role of the body, which may be another way to be... Yeah. Not lost because there is this ritual of the body, and so it's interesting. W yes, it's very. I found it very in interesting. Yeah. yeah. In the meditation tradition, while I'm listening to your talk, what we call loss, hmm? loss and the mind wandering. I think there's difference. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could. Have, yeah. You could. Be, you could have a thought yeah, right. wi without be lost. Yeah. Right, right. Mm. For for the meditation, you can think. Mm. Mm. You can. You can even ruminate, mm. but rumination becomes support for meditation uh -huh. if you apply awareness with the rumination. Yeah. So that we don't call loss. Yeah. Yeah. So at what moment would you call it lost in a meditator? You become zombie. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you forget awareness, you forget what you're doing. Yeah. You forget the, you're meditating. Mm -hmm. So there's the sense of kind of like sometimes what I call we have monkey mind mm -hmm. and normally monkey mind giving us job. Mm -hmm. But if you can give job to the monkey mind, then you're not lost. Yeah. But still there's a monkey mind. Yeah. Another example is there's a thought meditation. Thought meditation ha can have various thought, positive, negative, whatever, blah, 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 yeah, yeah. but you need to Watch thought. Mm. When you watch thought, and the example I mentioned before, when you see the river, you're out of river, but river still continued. Yeah. It doesn't change the river. Yeah. And the last meaning, you fall in the river, carried by river. Yeah. So that's how we make the distinctions. Yeah. Thank you. So... Um, 
if that concludes the the, the exchange on on uh, Marike's presentation, then yeah, we could actually it's a good transition because we uh, researchers have been studying what's happened when you jump in the river. So if you want, I could show <laughs> an example of that in a, in a second. Mm -hmm. If uh, you could pre show the second presentation. So Rinpoche, I'm just going to follow up on, on uh, your comment and, and Marike's presentation on, on <coughs> exploring some of the natural quality of the mind from a neuroscientific perspective. And um <coughs> so looking at the, the as Marike um, already did, and the relationship between mindfulness meditation and the monkey mind. So you, when you were presenting, you, you, you highlight three qualities, uh, which um, which are somehow presented here also. So you mentioned uh, applicability, mm -hmm. which um, here I discuss as this capacity to anchor attention in the present moment and often through anchoring your, your awareness in the body as for beginners, it's a useful tool. You, m you mentioned um, uh, becoming friend or so that what we, we mentioned this capacity to be have this open, uh, non-reactive, non curious uh, awareness to experience moment after moment. And then uh, this notion of understanding, as you said, the nature of perception. So, so these three process or quality that we, we, we have been trying to characterize them scientifically over the years, and I'm going to try to illustrate um, how scientists did to do that. And on the left, you can see a, a, a metaphor for the monkey <laughs> mind and, uh, from India. <laughs> okay, so, so you were discussing, you, um, Marike knew about this uh, mind wandering and, and what's happened when you get lost. And so a couple of years ago, uh, a researcher, uh, um, Wendy Adenkampf, uh, tried to do this exercise in the, in the, in the scanner. So they asked someone to focus the mind on a, on, on a cross and to press a button when you were in the river, when you get lost. And then they, they look at different, um, uh, different moments, what's happened wha when you were mind wandering, what's happened when you become aware of you were wandering, and what's happened when you, when you reorient your attention to the object and sustain it. And what you can see using these uh, brain imaging techniques, fMRI, which measure if you want, how much uh, oxygen is used in the brain mm -hmm. moment after moment. And so it it's gives you an area that, on average, are more engaged during one of these phases. So it's only part of what happens in the brain. The brain is, act is active, active, many, many regions are activated, but that's, on average, some regions that are more activated. And you see that Marike was uh, talking about this uh, default mode networks before which is a midline region, and they are uh, 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 often present in, in uh, disgusting thinking. Uh, and you can see that when you are become aware of a thought, there is an engagement of another brain region, that's um, what's called the science networks, that are almost a, a, a network that are reflecting anything Im important, salient, or uh, that, that call for uh, an action for, for a reorientation of attention. And then you can see that the uh, next cycle is an uh, uh, engagement of the networks in the brain called the central executive networks that are really involved in, in controlling where you put your attention. So this that's a nice little metaphor or, almost to describe how we can measure in science um, the different moments of, of attention. But um, what we've been trying uh, a couple of years ago with uh, Ellen Slachter and Richard Davidson um, we use this task to try to distinguish between two styles of, of uh, um, awareness, uh, uh, what you call a non-meditative awareness, when you, you get um, lost, uh, you, you kind of just engage with the world without this monitoring or this, with this uh, uh, clarity of the mind, from a more med meditative awareness. So we, we compare, uh, use this task that I'm going to briefly explain when you, your job is to, for instance, very to detect two, two numbers, five and three. And, uh, and they are embedded into a st uh, stream of letters, like five R H L, and, fi and then five and A and three. And um, often, when you are presenting the, the target, the five 
uh, followed by a, and then the three uh, with a very short interval between them, like 300 milliseconds. Often you will see the first one, the five, but you will miss the, the, the third one. And that is supposed to reflect um, the limitation of your attention capacity. So it's as if, the, the, because the mind is grasping or engaging in the object, you are, don't have any more space or resources to, to treat the, the oncoming um, uh, sensory stimulation. So from a viewpoint of the, the participant, he's just not aware of the second one, the three. And, and that is correlated to a certain, certain pattern of the brain activity. So with the EEG, you can measure uh, what is called an event-related potential, which is um, measuring how much attention you're giving to the, the first one. And so what we test uh, during this study is whether through intensive uh, meditation training for so three months, eight hours a day, uh, you will somehow uh, develop, as you explain, a capacity to um, just monitor, be aware of the of the of your mind, uh, without too much grasping, without too much uh, um, with a minimal engagement. So high monitoring, but no, not lost in the object. And uh, what we found with Ellen Slarter is that there was indeed more. Uh, you were more capable after the retreat to detect this. Uh, not only the first one, the five, but also the second one. And what was very interesting is that that was correlated to a reduction in the, uh, the magnitude of attention you had to, to engage in the first one. So it's because you, if you want, you, you need less, uh, you, less attention, you are more open, there is more space to see the second one. So, uh, so that, that what you can see here, the change in the mind, uh, the change in, in, in this brain function predict change in your um, experience and mental capacity to detect the second one. So it's a nice, nice illustration about um, the first process of how uh, meditation training can help you to um, regulate how you uh, engage your attention and how you cultivate this form of uh, non-reactive, non-grasping attention. So now I'm going to illustrate a second uh, theme, which is this uh, that which is this notion of uh, more about the nature of perception. So you you mentioned that one uh, quality of awareness that is important is to to when if you want the light start to be recognized itself. Okay. <coughs> so in this context. It mean, how would it mean in terms of perception? Now, uh, I'm going to ask uh, you in Petre and the audience to do a little experiential exercise and to illustrate what we, how we try to manipulate your uh, awareness in perception. So, if you could please look at these images of a food, a strawberry, and look at it for quite some time and let your mind be absorbed into it. And do as if this is a real strawberry and as if you, you're about to uh, eat it or grasp it, so make, make it as if it's real in front of you and you can engage with it. Rinpoche, have you, have, you, have you managed to do it? Yeah. Uh, I eat two strawberries. <laughs> two strawberries. <laughs> <laughs> would, would you mind sharing with you, what, how, what, what, did you experience something in your body or any emotions? Yeah, of course. I like, not the sour one, but I like <laughs> <laughs> sweet strawberry. So I imagine sweet strawberry, pleasant wave of the sensation comes, and now s s my mouth is full of saliva, you know, it's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I I so that, that excellent. So even without, so it's not real, but the, we can trick our mind, and uh, we can trick our body with our mind and, and, and trigger this, this salivary reflex. So... How many of you in the audience uh, have a sensation of salivation? Could you raise your hand? Okay, so like a third of the, of the space. So it's a very, it's a very fundamental um, process, and it really reflects something amazing about our mind, is, is that our perception, the way we engage with an object like that, imaginary object, that, um, really reflects a fundamental um, 
process of the, m of the mind, which is to build reality, make that things appear as real. And, and so what we, we try to contrast that style of experience that we call self-immersion with a, a form of mindfulness practice. And, and as Rinpoche explained, that in meditation you try to recognize some of the, of the process engaged in perception. So you try to recognize the feeling tone, the sense of, of uh, grasping, the salivation, the recognize the thought as thoughts. So all of these things, it's a... Um, is a second style of, 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 uh, of state that we study. So if you want to, to sim simplify, we compare two, two ways of perception, a normal awareness that focus on the object, from a meditative awareness, that when you emphasize more the reflexive aspect of it. And um, so I was the wo work doing a PhD of Constanza Bakedano, and <coughs> when you ask pa participants, novices and, and experienced practitioners to describe their experience when they, you have these two manipulation, they will tell you that they are more a sense of meta-awareness during the, the mindfulness one, there is less craving, there is a less of a sense of there is more a sense of derification, so you, you don't, things appear not as solid or real when you, you just observe them mindfully. And importantly, when you ask these participants to to spit in a little, little tube before and after this manipulation in the two conditions, you see a difference in the volume of salivation as you all experience. <laughs> and, and so, so that was very, so, so just a way to, to demonstrate the, the, what we all experience. But then the idea was to also look at the behavioral marker. So what are the consequences of this manipulation? How does it, that? Why, what are the consequences of, of mental habits uh, um, when you 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 engage and get absorbed in, into a, a, a food images? And so we use this task that is called an approach awareness task. So the same images after these two manipulation were used in, in a task when you need to detect two cues, uh, a square which is uh, or a circle. And related to this, so but behind this square on the circle, you have the same food images. Uh, but in one case, uh, what's called the approach condition, when you press the, detect the square, the, the things are coming back to you. So it's an, uh, an approach mode. And when the other condition, when you press, it's a void. So it's as if it's uh, pressing a, the, the cue makes you things coming to you or away from you. And what is, what is nice with this paradigm is that when you need to do that you press faster when you need to have an attractive food that is coming to you, you press faster, but when you are in the condition when it's going away and you really like the food, <laughs> there is in your mind a little conflict, very fat, very s and, and that's uh, reflecting a m slightly slower reaction times. And that's actually m reflect this, what we call a food bias, how much you, uh, your perception is biasing the behavior. And what we found is that in the, the manipulation, when you were engaged and, and in the food image as if they are real, that's induced a much stronger food bias than when you are in the mindful condition. And, and the more you were, um, people report that they feel sticky, as you said before, uh, during the self-immersion, the more there was food bias. So you can really see how that there are consequences about the way you engage with perception. And, and recently, that's unpublished, we, with Consanza and, uh, and, uh, and Romain Quentin in our group, we, we use this EG, the EEG signal during this task to decode, uh, using machine learning, the food preferences of the participants. So we were able to detect whether you like or not a strawberry or, or hamburger. <laughs> so we are capable to, to, de to, to the classifier can say, well, uh, can detect whether the food is, is, is likable or not. And you can do for in all condition for both group in the first 200 milliseconds. But what is very interesting is that for the practitioners only, during the mindfulness condition, you see uh, a, 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 um, a decrease in the performance of the decoding uh, when uh, they are in the mindful condition, meaning that Somehow, through this regulation of mindfulness, it's harder to decode the food preferences when people have started to be just monitoring their food, their, their mind, um, when they start to monitor the experience of, um, of the, the food image. With that, for me, it's a nice correlate about 
reflecting maybe the, the, the regulation by meditation of, um, of, uh, of appe food appearance. So, so that's uh, an illustration about how meditation could uh, downregulate some of this, um, um, some of the, um, the, the the food craving, if you want. So, to summarize, the first part of the talk showed that you can um, uh, downregulate thought or the monkey mind, and uh, through two two capacity, one capacity to control and monitor the content of your mind and through a capacity to what we call cognitively diffuse or derify the content of the mind, what you can call it to, to recognize the mind is just the mind. And, and I gave some example about how uh, mindfulness meditation practices can be used to cultivate this capacity. And now um, I, will, um, I will try to illustrate how this, the same process has consequences not also about how we cope with emotion and how they impact human suffering. And um, so now we're in Petre. And, and if I present you these images, can you recognize these images? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I never met that person. <laughs> <laughs> so it was you in Madison a long time ago. And if I present that thing here, do you remember? Hot. Very yeah. hot on my wrist, yeah. Yes. Almost burned. Now I have scar. Now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so for some person, when you present these things, it might be trigger some some uh, some sense of fear or worried and so on. Particularly if you are what's called pain catastrophizing. So pain catastrophizing is this t tendency that you exaggerate uh, or anticipate too much pain. It comes with a sense of rumination, or a sense of magnification, so amplification of that, or a sense of helplessness, or I cannot cope with the pain. So. We were interesting to to see how mindfulness could um, practices could could uh, change the way you you experience um, a physical pain, and whether that's modulated by the, the your capacity to be to be pain uh, to, to catastrophize pain, and that and that's the uh, hypothesis, which is that meditation is is really good at at uh, reducing what's called the second arrow of pain. So. Not the physical one, but the, uh, this amplification of pain by the mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, we, for that, with, this, with Yelizon doing his PhD, we, we designed a task that would, what was made to amplify or exaggerate uh, pain pedagogizing. So you were getting this, this thermal pain, like you did, but we also warned them in advance whether there will be heat, it will be painful, or it will be okay, it will be warm. So they knew it, so they could ruminate a little bit. And also we have two types of, of, of stimulus, one very short, so okay, and one really long. And, and, they, and they knew after a couple of seconds that we'll tell you now, bad luck, it's not the short one, <laughs> it's gonna be the long one. You're gonna <laughs> stay there for 12 more seconds. So the idea that you will suddenly maybe have more emotions, more rumination, and. And we, we predict that, particularly in the condition of long one, you will have, um, it will be harder to decouple the, the intensity from the affective one, and for novices, but not, uh, the, uh, not for experts. Mm -hmm. and, and so indeed, uh, what we found is that, uh, uh, so th this graph represents the pain rating when we compare the intensity and pleasantness, and you see that, uh, we use that differences as a measure of this uh, pain of the, if you want, the second hour of pain. Is mm -hmm. If you can uncouple, uncouple the intensity and presentness, that would be a, 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 that we reflect this, your capacity to downregulate uh, pain. And uh, experts were, uh, in general, have a better capacity to do that, so they report less unpleasantness compared to novices. And that was particularly true in the condition of the long um, uh, stimulus. And what was also very interesting is that that uh, uncoupling so that of sensory and affect, that measure uh, was predicted by the, a scale 
uh, that uh, measure the pain catastrophizing. So more people are, have a tendency to catastrophize, the less they are able to decouple the intensity mm -hmm. or an, an effect. It's as if they're fusing. Everything is the same. It's just pain. Mm -hmm. But when you, you have a capacity to, if you have less pain catastrophizing and also a capacity to, to cognitively diffuse, meaning that you, you, then you can separate what is intensity and what is unpleasantness. Mm -hmm. and, and unpleasantness decrease. Mm -hmm. But for the, for, for, for the other one, for, for if you can't do, if, if you catastrophize, it's all the same mm -hmm. and it's, it's worst. And so we managed to do that and, that's, uh, and we show it modulated by expertise and meditation also. Voila. And so we are currently analyzing the brain and, uh, but I, I can just briefly talk about the hypothesis that, uh, as you maybe remember, there are different uh, brain regions that are participating to pain processing. Some regions in blue are more related to the sensory aspect of pain. Some um, in the orange, like the insula or cingulate cortex, are more associated to the affective aspect of pain, and other regions are more involved in the cognitive aspect of pain, so anticipation, regulation, and so on. And um, based on the previous study where we, we, you participate, we, we think that this um, uncoupling between sensory and affective, um, uh, this uncoupling of pain in meditation is likely to influence a region called the entire insula mm -hmm. that is uh, participated in, the, in affects, the feeling, and also engaged uh, in um, uh, anticipatory anxiety or... Um, our awareness also, and we, and we in the previous study with you, we found that the chronometry, so the time course of the entire insula, was different uh, for experts compared to novices uh, in response to pain because they were uh, novices had a tendency to to anticipate to have a already a, uh, an anticipatory activation, uh, while experts didn't show the same pattern and. Um, but they have a much stronger response during pain, but it recovers much faster. So we think that th that, uh, that would be a good place to uh, understand the behavioral finding that I just shown. So that's uh, where we're at, and I can give you a quick uh, summary of that part. So we, we found that mindfulness meditation is related to a sensory affective uncoupling of pain, when you can experience intensity distinct from the sensory uh, affective one, and, and, um, and, th and that was modulated by a, a, a mindfulness instruction, novice and experts, uh, and it was uh, amplified by expertise. And we found that pain catastrophizing predict this uncoupling, and it was negatively associated with cognitive diffusion. Uh, and finally, as I said, the state of mindfulness itself downregulates no uh, the neural representation of pain anticipation in the entire insula in expert meditators only. So that, that's finished my presentation, uh, and I try to, to, to summarize, illustrate different quality of, of the, the mind and how we, we start to, through different paradigms to, to measure them um, uh, during meditative states uh, or for experts, and also looking at um, the plasticity of this process uh, as a result of the practice. So thank you for your attention. So at that stage, I think um, that could be a, a time we already uh, uh, discussed a little bit about uh, Marike's presentation. So if there's any comments from Mingo Rinpoche or Marike to what we just heard from, from Antoine. Yeah, I remember about the... Uh, mm. uh, it's kind of... Th thermo 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 pain. A uh, thermo like pro probe, yeah. yeah. Look like watch, right? Box. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In the middle is uh, heat coming. Heat, right? yeah, the water, hot water coming through it. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, what I was thinking mm. is, um, so clarity of heat during the meditation, clarity, the intense, intense mm. of heat increase, right? Mm. So you can see heat very clear, mm. experience heat very clear, but the, the an anticipation, the mm. The rumination is less. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. 
So yeah, I think this is um, what we call the, when we meditate, then there's a capacity to see the reality more clear when we're aware. But uh, normally what we call the rumination cover the, the reality. So you don't see reality very clear, a lot of rumination. So anticip the pain itself, unclear. Mm. And you make something else. Everything become one, right? What we okay. call singularity. Yeah, yeah. Then pain becomes so solid and strong. But when we be present with the object, whatever comes in the mind, the clarity of phenomena, clarity of object, whatever perception clear, the rumination is less. So, yeah, very, very interesting. Yeah, so that, that reflects um, some of the, actually, the, the effect that, that when you, people don't, um, people catastrophize more, they tend to rate the same way intensity and unpleasantness, and it's higher than than when you are low in... Um, so, so, so people who, who are worried, everything is the same. The intensity and unpleasantness, it's, uh, in experience, it's the same. And uh, people who are, who are less bothered, it's, um, you can have a very high intensity, and then, or then the, there is an uncoupling, and naturally the, the, um, the um, affective one is lower. Right. And, and, uh, and, and for me, that, that's maybe to be also related to the other, other study I presented before, like the one when you, you, know, you, you see very quickly many, many, many things. When you are, you are non, uh, they have this non-reactive awareness, you have more, more attentional resources. Right. And, and so you can use these resources to regulate, actually, affect. And uh, so that, that's actually the core mechanism, because there is more space, there is more resources, and you can then do more things with your mind and decompose sensory and affective. Right. And as a result of that, it doesn't bother you as much. Right. But if you, you don't have space, then it's all the same and it's bothering you more. So, Wonderful. Mm. So normally, we have emotion meditation. So mm. I practice a lot of emotion meditation when I was young mm. because I'm having panic, panic attacks. So as soon as if you try to watch panic, try to look at the panic, normally where? So normally we think panic is just single, one, solid. But when we really look at the panic, where? So then you need to look at the sensation. And there's an image, voice, believe. So panic becomes four pieces. Hmm. So when you see these pieces, then the panic loses the power. Normally, these three, these four become one, so strong. But just, just seeing pieces here, there, then decompose. decompose. So what we call multiplicity. Mm. So seeing multiplicity is a wisdom. Mm. Yeah. So inten intens intensity mm. and, uh, and pleasantness. unpleasantness. It can make separate yes, it's and the less mm. strong the Pain is. Mm. And in the literature on depression, it is the same finding. I didn't have time to present it, but uh, colleagues uh, who work on depression, they, they, they found that if you can become aware of your thoughts and if you can look at the thought as a thought, so you don't look at the thought and as a thought and, 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 and decompose what right. you just described then that predicts your capacity not to fall into depression again, mm. Mm. which is what Marike, you mentioned, the notion of tickiness. Mm. So that's th that the same idea. They, in, the, in the literature on depression, they found that that's uh, the, wow. the, 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 the mechanism that explained the most mm. the, the, the effect of that mindfulness have on, on the relapse into depression. So there is a literature that shows that you can be protected after mindfulness training. Mm. And what it is, the code of that is this, this recognition that the thought is a thought. Mm. Right. That protects you from relapsing into depression because then you, you, don't, you, you don't identify with the thoughts. Mm. You're not become one with yeah, thought. Exactly. You're not in the river. Exactly. Mm. Mm. 
I have one question. Uh, what Rumbachit just described in terms of being able to see the the multiplicity of emotions. So in your study, uh, by uh, watching the pain and not getting into rumination or mm -hmm. anticipation about the pain, was this a kind of uh, a practice that were, was done or was it more like an observing of the sensation as it appeared? So we, I didn't have time to to present the whole paradigm. So I, uh, but we, we did have the whole participant at two states. One state when it was a form of open awareness. So they say, just, just be relaxed. Um, welcome, welcome Pam, just observe, be, be aware of it, don't fall in the river. That one state. And the other state was, uh, don't look at the pain, but count little numbers. Mm -hmm. So be, be very tight, just count the number, and don't look at the pain. And there was much more like tight things. And when you do this simple manipulation, when you tight like that, you can't decouple the pain as much. But even novices can do the, when they open awareness, they, they, they see an effect. And so uh, if I have just the time, I, that was, I was a little bit um, surprised because in the study in Madison, we found uh, uh, when you do a state manipulation, we compare Shine and open, open, our open presence. Mm. And the experts were much better than the novices at, at, uh, at uncoupling. Mm. When we did that in Lyon, we trained the novices for one weekend. And, I, I, and the state manipulation was actually as good as the experts. Mm. So in general, the expert can uncouple the two much better. But, uh, but when, you, when you do the meditation, it was actually not as... Um, They were, yeah, you don't see, the, the novices can also do it. Mm. But there was one difference that you, you could see in, um, with the experts is that the, I, 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 I realized that they were doing this non-dual awareness practice, this uh, 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 open presence practice. And so when we look with the students into why, why it was not so clear like that, what's happened is actually when you... So there were different blocks. A block when you do open presence and then tight, open presence and tight. And we realized that when the expert will start with an no open non-dual meditation and then we'll do a tight one, even in the tight one, they were uh, still naturally deco decoupling the pain. So once you start to, have a, to, to do the practice, it was very hard to come back to a tight one. But when they start for the first block, a tight one, and then do an open, uh, um, an open presence, then you could see that the expert start w were actually initially not very good at decoupling. Mm. And, then, and then it was much bigger the effect when, when you have this um, open awareness. But, but if they do the other way around, when the experts start to open with open awareness, it was very hard for them to come back to a tight one. Mm. So that's why we don't see a strong effect with because it's once you start with the ex for an expert when they start to the practice, it's 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 remain uh, even if when they do they try not to do it. Mm. So would you comment on, on that, Rinpoche, Maybe could be could be. I think also depend on the practitioner mm. what the main main practice is. Mm. If the expert main focus is open awareness, then. Maybe they don't do so much analytical meditation. E exactly, they were mostly doing um, nature of mind practice. So for them, it's hard not to do it, I think. Mm. Yeah, so I was also curious, and maybe actually from both you, Antoine, and, and you, Rinpoche, um, what do you think are, are the most helpful practices to deal with pain? I mean, so we've talked really about focused attention kind of practices and open presence, but I can also imagine that compassion practices could be helpful. So do you have any thoughts? On the, you mean emotional pain or physical pain? I'd be curious about both, actually. <laughs> I mean, the physical pain for me, watching pain is really helps. Mm. So when I have pain in the body to watch, sometimes disappear, sometimes even not disappear, Pain is there, but the, what do you call, anticipation or rumination, mm. the suffering of pain is mm. less. Yeah. 
But the mental pain, I think, is a, depends maybe pain from panic mm. or pain from depression. It might need to do a different little bit meditation, mm -hmm. different style. Mm -hmm. We have a data set on pain uh, and compassion. We, we it's not finished yet, mm -hmm. but we we try to see whether um, when you uh, the yeah when you you see the suffering of someone and either you just resonate with it without compassion or, or if you are compassionate with the other one, whether that change the way you're gonna ex experience the pain. Yeah. So, so, so if you, if you, if your heart, so the intuition is that if you caring for the other, when you receive the pain, it's not going to bother you as much. At yeah. So I don't know if it's you. you yeah. Will yeah. 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 Looking forward to hearing yeah, the results. We'll <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. I think the for the these kind of meditation for us, we have to do step by step. Mm. So first, if you have pain, at the beginning you watch pain, quite difficult. You will lost in pain, and sometimes pain become bigger than before. Mm. So first, what we call to connect with the awareness, with the breath, with the sound, with the neutral object, mm. normally. At least one month. Maybe every day, five minutes, also okay. A little bit, but con consistency is very important. Then second step, awareness the body in general, scanning body and look at general and then next special focus on the pain maybe physical pain first mm. then after that so with the emotional pain three things important for us view meditation application so the view like to understand the fu fundamental level what is awareness or the belief maybe compassion Maybe the pain, you know, for, for others, or maybe, I don't know, pain has some meaningful, mm. some way connected with the others. Then less pain. Mm. So we have taken and sending practice like that. And number three, wisdom. So wisdom meaning deconstruct pain. So you l look at the pieces first. So first, like uh, sensation, image, Word, for example, if you're angry at somebody, then this pain comes. Hate, hate, if you hate someone. And then look at the, that hatred, the sensation in the body, the image of the person. You hate person or you, it doesn't matter, the object. And there's a lot of articulation, talking words. And there's a belief based on why this is doing right or wrong or should or not. There's a belief without that believe you, you will not have hatred so as soon as the the as soon as the become seeing the pieces the pain not become solid and strong anymore then second we need to see interdependent meaning these four comes together if you take out sensation no hatred if you take out object no hatred if you take out of that articulation there's no hatred. If you take out the bel belief, you cannot have hatred. Mm -hmm. So how they are connecting each other, interdependent. Then number three, they are changing, 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 mm -hmm. impermanent. Then in the end, emptiness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it seems uh, we are uh, Unless there's um, some more comments from Marika or Antoine, maybe at this stage we could move to some some questions from from the audience. Yeah. I think we might have some hands. Mic runners. So, uh, uh, there's a mic coming. Oh. Just a mm -hmm. moment. So I uh, was wondering about this lab experiment and um, saw the th same thing that Antoine mentioned, uh, those components of uh, social interaction and physical movement. And then in your next study, Antoine, you said um, there's going to be a, 
uh, inspection of compassion and pain, which pain for me relates to physical sensation. And I was wondering, did you repeat those experiments uh, with the two monks um, in variations where like, uh, they didn't have this social interaction? They were just watching a, a screen of a recording. Did you tell them maybe to stop clapping and not move and repeat the experiment? Because I, I, I was then reminded uh, in, in the moments where the clapping was going on that there was a feedback going on, a physical feedback that I also experienced in the beginning of my meditation sessions where the posture was uncomfortable, the knees were uh, I felt my knees, uh, and the, but the feedback from my body allowed me to be more in the here and now. I'm meditating. This is meditation. And once the, the, the feedback from my body went away, I had a much tougher time to actually um, control my thoughts, or not control, but you know, uh, not wander off <laughs> and actually thought two minutes about uh, the shopping list for the next day and then woke up and say, oh, okay, I did that thing again. Mm -hmm. So that's my question, um, just the relationship between uh, social interaction and um, physical sensation. <laughs> I guess I, I'll give, a, give it a try and then Anton <laughs> should also add if, if they want to. So the short answer is we did not um, and not, not managed to try to um, take out like the clapping or the social parts just because the debate doesn't work without that. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we definitely, we, we put on our scientists' heads and we're like, can we deconstruct this? But it's a whole like, and you can't take out a part, then it just falls all apart. Um, but I think you could potentially come up with interventions and in, in the mindfulness they are now starting to do that which are de called deconstruction trials where you say you do mindfulness but without acceptance or you just only concentration and similarly i can imagine we can we, we are actually working on um, uh, teaching debates outside the monastery to whoever is interested we had two uh, winter schools online um, and we're doing our first um, or rather well the monastery is doing their first uh, debate win uh, winter school in, in person in uh, November, December of this year. I'm just involved now for the um, uh, scientific research on that. And, and that is a bit more controlled intervention. And there I can imagine we can also do it without the clapping. We've also been studying debate ourselves on Zoom and then the clapping also doesn't work. So I guess we're moving towards that, but in our studies in Sito in the monastery, that was very difficult to do. And um, yeah, I think in general, the body is a very profound um, F influence on, on our thinking. And um, there's even some work on like how posture affects thinking that like when you're sitting slouched, your thoughts are different than when you're sitting up straight. So there's a lot to be studied there. I, I um, I'm going to also make um, a reply. I, I'm not sure I necessarily follow all, all of your point, but so F first, uh, the role of, of uh, the social context. I think it's it's um, it's present in ev every experiment, um, and it's and it actually at the essence of everything we we do anyway. So it's if one point I, I, I may say that I think the future in the, in our field is to really acknowledge more and more the role of of the context. Mm. And uh, for instance, I, I remember in the all the experts, Yogi who came to the lab and. I, they always ask the first question when I ask them to to come to the lab. They always ask them w w how is going to be beneficial, mm. yeah. and and I I I see I see it's, it's amazing. It's the first question they uh, all uh, all asking. So I think that they they don't there is a social context, and so the brain we're measuring is not outside the social context. They come here because we told them it's beneficial, and they think they're going to do something beneficial by receiving pain on death. So, so it's, for them, it's part of the like, um, altruistic activity. So it, it is a social process already. Mm. Now, for the body, the same. It's, we don't have time to go into detail, but it's, 
it's uh, it's a central um, the posture is, is central in, in, in these things and we, we with a colleague Giuseppe Pagnoni we, we develop a, a little model of mind wandering um, where in relation to, 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 to body to the body posture and, and um, so it's going to be hard to explain in two seconds but the, the idea is that it's possible that the posture uh, and the quality of, of the stillness of your body uh, is actually, as you said, you use the term feedback loop, but it, it could be used as, as a way to, to wake up sooner from a distraction. Why? And it's hard to explain in two seconds, but it's because you, you are, if you, you, you're very f aware of your body and very, uh, a, very, a very still posture, you, you, you're giving a lot of precision to, to bodily signal, such as the moment you are distracted, it's possible that that will create th a, an error signal, because that was not predicted, but that's going to be amplified because it was, it, it was something uh, very precise before, so the error will be much stronger. And so the waking up will be much faster. So that gives you an idea that how you could make a little model, as we propose, that, 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 that the posture is actually, you, the precision to the body is used to wake up sooner and faster. It has not been tested, but that's some of the idea you could use to, to justify the role of the posture in mind wandering. I have a question that I'm ruminating a lot about, is um, that uh, it seemed to me that in the scientific research, also what we have seen here, um, the definition of mind is very related to the brain. And, uh, and so I, I'm really wondering, what is the definition of mind in, 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 in Western um, uh, science? Is there a consens? And because if I'm thinking about uh, the study of mind in Buddhism, very often the masters tell body, speech, and mind, and they point here at the heart. And so how does this go together with the Buddhist definition of mind? And how maybe also in the future the scientific research could kind of maybe, I don't know, um, come into a territory that cannot be measured anymore or that the ways to study the mind sh could change? I don't know if this is, but this is a question. So, so can I just start? I don't know if you, and you follow, my, my previous answer was exactly at that point. So I gave you two arguments that why the, two examples about the role of the context, social context to understand the brain measure that we're doing, which was a m the altruistic motivation. And then I give you an example about the role of the body in a, in, in a, in to understand mind wandering. Mm. And I just clearly illustrate that uh, in science, you, you, you have uh, a, a lot of interest for the role of the, the body and culture and the environment to, to understand the mind. And so, but you're, you're, but it's important to, to emphasize that there are multiplicity of view in science, and sometimes it sounds that it's very brain-centered, but it's, it's often a, a shortcut to, 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 to that we have, but the, the, the you, you have view in um, cognitive science that are, view the mind as embodied, <coughs> as I just said, embedded in a culture, uh, and, and dynamic, so, so which is much more bro broader than simply the, the brain. So, so uh, I understand where you're coming from, but, but I, I can just tell you that there are multiplicity of view in the field, and, and some of them are m much more aligned with what you are proposing. Yeah, maybe just to add to that, I would say that in science, probably there's no definition of mind because mind is sort of too broad, we, we divide it up into much smaller components, like we're talking about attention and mind wandering and memory and working memory and lo lots of different capacities of the mind to describe different ways of how the mind works. Um, having said that, I would say that science is about measurable things, whether that's about the brain, 
or behavior or self-reports of what people say. I mean, that's, I think, what science is about. It doesn't mean that anything that science cannot measure does not exist. It's just that it's not within the domain of science. Um, so, yeah, and that, that's also why we, we, yeah, we can study the mind and we can say, well, you know, this is what we can say from science about the mind, but then that might not be everything there is, but I can't say that anything about that um, from the scientific perspective. And from the Buddhist perspective, what we call mind and body like cup and the water. So the body is like cup and the mind is like water in the cup. So they are interdependent. Hmm. And the traditional example of what we call chariot and charioteur. So chariot is the body, the charioteur is the mind. And I was thinking, maybe a modern example is an aeroplane and pilot. <laughs> so aeroplane has everything, like computer like brain, engine like heart, the what we call nadi, the nerves like wires, prana like electricity, prana meaning energy, and food like oil, and the arms and wing, arms, legs like wings and wheels but someone need to guide the aeroplane. So that pilot or someone to guide is the mind, but the aeroplane has everything, all this. So without all this, plane cannot be function. Without someone guide, also plane cannot be function. So mind and body always goes together. There's no such thing, only mind exists without body, or mind is completely matter. So for us, it's interdependent mm -hmm. for the meditation tradition. So even you fully enlightened, what we call body become enlightened body, vajra body, and mind become enlightened mind. So they are interdependent. Yeah, and also the pilot cannot exist without the plane because then he's no longer a pilot. Pilot, yeah. yeah. Cannot fly, just pilot, pilot you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But, but that's also uh, very close to some of the, the framework that you... you so, so first I have to say, in science there is what's called the mind, 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 um, body and mind problem. So it, it's, we, say we call it mind and body problem, because just to acknowledge that we don't have necessarily a clear, <laughs> clear solution. <laughs> and so it's like, but it's, it's in a way it's, it's somehow close to what you described, that there, are, uh, there is a body and, and, uh, and what we call mind is... is um, all the, the, the mental function that arise from an organism uh, that allow him to perceive, that are, yeah, that are associated to perception, attention, memory, uh, consciousness. And so in broad sense, that, that's, that's what we call mind in a way. And, and we also acknowledge that you said that they are they're co co emergent one and other. And there is. Yeah. yeah. For example, now we imagine strawberry and suddenly body produce saliva. So the mind influences the body. Mm. And then mm. as a like your body is almost receiving the strawberry, right? Mm. So they influence each other. Yeah. And we before we the exercise we did that it was the other way. We we mentally influence the body and so Yes. Yeah. And probably by somebody who's never seen a strawberry and knows what it is, they wouldn't produce the saliva, so also the world in which they live will influence how mm. yeah. they respond. Yeah, yeah because, because you, as you said, like if you, we are embedded in a culture and, and for instance, you need, we need a, some a teacher to, to, to sometimes to transmit one from one generation to the next, so there is also the role of, of of um, community of mind to mm -hmm. to experience certain things also. Yeah. I don't know if you answer your question, but it's. Uh, yeah. There's I think in, in the, the front. The uh, second row. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two questions. The first goes to our Buddhist experts, and this is just to understand better, because I'm not familiar with your debate tradition. The uh, first question is, is there a ritual when you use the movement that is taught, 
or is that an impulsive choice of the student? And the, the second question is, is the debate such that you can debate according to your own uh, views or is this uh, also a ritual where you are instructed to debate sometimes with this argument, sometimes with that argument, no matter if you agree with that or not. So it's just, just to understand. And then quickly the second question. Um, I keep it, try to keep it brief. Maybe we can wait. Yep. Hold this second, <laughs> and we ask Rinpoche to respond to the first. Yeah. So debate normally. First, we need to learn the debate structure. It's a very complicated thing. You have to think a lot. So many things in that short sentence. So we have to learn the structure, and then when we begin to learn, then there is system that you there's a what do you call debate and debater. Mm -hmm. Damjawa, how yeah. to say? Yeah, the, the defender. defender. Defender and the debate person? Yeah, yeah. the debater. Mm -hmm. Debater. Mm -hmm. So debater stand up, defender sit down, and there's tradition like holding hand like this. There's so many meanings, each one. And then, like, feet go up, and then. So, when the claps, feet also like this. And the. At the beginning, we need to learn about how to debate about color. Colors, the main color, branch color, then slowly, slowly lead to, then in the end, you can debate about anything. So you can debate about, somebody said, yeah, the, the phenomena are impermanent. Others said, no, no, it's permanent. Why is permanent? Now you have to debate. So, for example, uh, Fire, so there's three things first. The fire is the subject of debate, base of debate. And what you're going to debate is heat or not. The second is the fire is heat or not. Third, you have to have reason. So, for example, this uh, fruit of the plant is edible or not. So the fruit is based on debate. It's edible or not is the subject of debate and the reason. So first need to think the fruit has the reason or not. Second, now you have to see if uh, so this opposite and no, there's opposite and the how to say, translate. Uh, 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 it, it matches. Yeah, it matches on another object. The subject of debate and the reason you can understand with another example. Because now you don't understand on that fruit, but you can understand that in another object. And then, yeah, then opposite of that, the reason also not there. So there's a lot of things there to do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I made an attempt uh, for, for one year to study debate, and I, I can see the difficulty of explaining it to theory because it's something that really kind of needs to be internalized. And what I find most interesting is that it is strictly formalized. So the clear formula of how you actually construct an argument mm -hmm. within the uh, the debate format, which I find interesting in terms of context, mm -hmm. because like Western debate, Western style debate through the Greek tradition, it's very informal, like, you know, like any, anybody can say anything. Mm -hmm. And here we have a very clear context yeah. in which... The structure is very clear, but the, within the structure you can say anything. Yes. Yes. So, but then this systematically, whether your reason is match, not match, you have to look at it from different direction. Mm. Not just some indication, but so many different direction. So, yeah. yeah Which results in applicability of mind, because you have a, a structure, but you can, one part of your question was right, uh, 
do you then simply adopt opposing views that might not be necessarily yours? And that, in my experience, uh, was, was something that I learned from it is always possible to adopt another view. And that brings us to the you know, less stickiness, mm -hmm. more pliability through this kind of practice. Yeah, one thing that I found really interesting is that one of um, my um, monk uh, scientific collaborators, uh, Geshe Tsapke, um, who is an amazing, uh, bright um, monk, Geshe, um, he, he told me that he would sometimes use you know, a particular position as like, let's research like what it means to take this position and then maybe the next day he'd try another one. So it was literally like a research tool, which I think is a very beautiful concept because it also already innately um, conveys this sense of flexibility. So you're not married to a particular position. You're trying this one out today and maybe another one tomorrow. Mm. So maybe because I have to say it would be good for scientists for us to do it more often. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. So we're coming close to the last part of, of this evening uh, by having some guidance from Rumbacher, but I didn't want to uh, kind of cut you off in your second part of the question. So if you can hold that brief. Mm. Yes. Um, Okay, as brief as possible, and this is um, also to open to all. But your your researching has shown that that actually the the non meditators are more catastrophizing. So I'm curious. The the real life shows that uh, s uh, sadly, oftentimes people do very unreasonable things because they underestimate the risk. And I usually thought they must be somehow distracted. You know, whether it's uh, drunk driving, uh, doing crazy things that you've seen in social media and trying them for real, uh, everything. You know, all sorts of things that lead to accidents. And I usually thought, well, they must be totally distracted. So I'm wondering, is there anything in the research field around that area that also goes around... Um, you know, uh, does wandering, mind wandering also re <laughs> reduce seeing catastrophic consequences because you're distracted from seeing obvious catastrophic risks? Also, whatever, you know, going to debt because you're buying much too much, all, all sorts of health risks you're running into, you know, because you're distracted from seeing the negative impact. Y yeah, so can, can I start? So, so... Um, what I what I heard from you is that th there are there are actually um, it is adaptive to to un to worried it's adaptive to anticipate and you're totally right it's um, uh, <coughs> it is maladaptive not to to be to anticipate or to be vigilant um, what this scale is really about is a, is a maladaptive form. Of anticipation. So, in, in, in mindfulness, often the one of the one of the um, capacity you train is is a vigilance. So you always try to to know where you are, you, you, to be present, to be able to monitor, to be understand the consequences of your action. So, the practitioner do the, the adaptive thing that you're describing. That actually the I think my understanding one of the purpose of of this style of mindf of mindfulness is to be to to make the right action and uh, the right decision to be vigilant not to be lost into thought not to be lost into anger or any maladaptive behavior and to also try to use wisdom to make the right decision so uh, for that you need to be able to anticipate and so on so I think this scale of pain catastrophizing is not at all uh, about that it's about the maladaptive aspect of it when you exaggerate things people who Sometimes, to take the example of rumination that we discussed tonight, a thought, as Marike said before, a thought is useful. If you've got a problem, you have to think about it. What is not adaptive is to do it 30 times in a row when you exact same thoughts, because you're not going to learn anything else to keep asking the same thoughts, that's all. So that the, the, this repetitive thinking maladaptive, that's what is measured by 
the scale of cutoff finding, not the adaptive one. So thank you uh, for for the questions. And now I would like to request Mr. Rinpoche to give us some final guidance of how to deal with our ruminating mind. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the main thing is um, normally what I call um, to become, our mind become pliable, walkable, we need to know how to give job to monkey mind. So the monkey mind is normally just the opposite, right? When you say, don't think about pizza, what happened? We think about pizza. When you really need to think about pizza, Pizza disappear, you know. You go to the exam, exam hall, prepare all the answers, and try to get ready of the best result. As soon as you enter the exam hall, half become empty. <laughs> oh, I'm not remember. Oops, oops, and time's up. Soon as you come out from the exam, oh yeah, I remember, but too late. So, when I was young, for the panic, the most main supporter for panic is the panic of panic. Fear of panic, aversion of panic. Why is it like that? Because our mind has some, some kind of like, the monkey mind, has some kind of like restless nature. This is why what we call crazy monkey. Always moving and always does a lot of crazy things. And that energy of the monkey mind, sometimes what I call monkey mind love job, job, you know. Monkey mind want to do something always. And the job, in the end, end up problem. Monkey mind is not good, not bad, but the problem is if we are controlled by monkey mind, then problem. So now how to work with the monkey mind? Again, if you fight with the monkey mind, what happened? Monkey mind become your boss, bad boss, sorry, enemy. So you never win if you fight with the monkey mind. In the end, you lost. But if you listen to monkey mind, then you become crazy, right? <laughs> in the boss, in the company, if the boss is crazy, then company become crazy, isn't it? So that's not the good choice. Fight, not good choice. Listen, also not good choice. So now we have only one choice. Make friends. Make friends with the monkey mind. So how to make friends with the monkey mind? What monkey mind likes? Job. So you just give one job to monkey mind. Normally monkey mind giving us job. Now you can give job to monkey mind. So what is the job? Hello, watch the breath. Monkey mind says, oh yeah, yeah, good idea, breathing. <laughs> breathing in, breathing out, breathing pizza coming, breathing beer garden tonight, breathing. That's normal, it's okay. And then slowly, slowly you lost. Ask again to watch the breath. And the monkey mind says, oh yeah, sorry, sorry, I forget the breath. Oh, breathing again, breathing in. So what we call, don't give full-time job to monkey mind part-time job. <laughs> and when the monkey mind lost, don't give punishment. This is very important. Be kind to monkey mind. So when you can give job to the monkey mind, who's become boss? Now you become boss. Not only boss, you have become friend of monkey mind. So then 
in the end, what we call our mind become pliable, walkable. So we get the freedom from monkey mind. And I, since 2002, we, I went to the your laboratory and did a lot of research about the brain. So brain is capable of change. Neuroplasticity, then neuropathway, neurogenesis, then what else now? Neuro something? <laughs> <laughs> Epigenetic change, yeah, so many. So it means full of change. If you are born with unhappy, you can change happy person. There's a full of possibility, hope. But normally, who's changing? Monkey mind asks to change. The environment forces us to change. Situation forces us to change. We don't change by consciously much. We cannot change ourselves by consciously a lot. Normally, all this change by force, external force. But now, when we, through the meditation, you become boss. So how do you do that? So there are p few techniques. So the first, today, the breathing, I think you understand, right? How many of you know breathing meditation? Raise your hand. I mean, how many of you don't know breathing meditation? Raise your hand. Nobody. Great. Should we try briefly breathing meditation? Yes? Yes, raise your hand. Okay, I will ask you a question. How many of you are breathing right now? Raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, that is the breathing meditation. <laughs> so when I ask you, are you breathing now? Yes, you raise your hand, right? All of you, I hope. In that moment, what happened? The mind and breath together. So we are with the breath. And that is the breathing meditation, mind and breath together. So now next is sound meditation. So please keep your spine loosely straight, not tightly, loosely straight, and touch your feet to the ground. I cannot touch my feet to the ground because I have short leg. So, if you cannot touch your feet to the ground, no problem. <laughs> but not like this. Not like cross like this or like this. Just. And you can put your hand on your knees or join together. Now, please close your eyes and feel your body and feel the gravity in your body. Relax muscles in your body. And if you cannot relax, also okay. Allow that you cannot relax. It's the relaxing. Now please listen to sound. And as long as if your mind can hear the sound, that is become the sound meditation. And that is the giving job to the monkey mind. And meanwhile, pizza will come, beer garden will come, all different type of cheese will come. Let them come. Don't try to stop them. As long as if you still remember the sound, two cheese, three cheese, ten cheese comes, no problem. And of course, you cannot listen to sound too long, your mind. Just glimpse, 
Glimps, Glimps. Tolle, tolle, okay. And peace, okay, peaceful experience, okay. Not so peaceful, okay. Little bit irritating is okay. Don't worry about whatever feeling. As long as if you still hear the sound, if you still remember the sound, you are in meditation. Okay, now please slowly open your eyes and rest your mind for a few seconds. Okay, so this is how to give job to the monkey mind. And now you know, remember it's part-time job. And second important thing is, don't try to stop thinking. Pizza, beer garden, or whatever in, in your life. Let thought come, let thought go. As long as if you still remember the sound, a glimpse. So this is a very important skill. That how we um, becoming the master of our own mind. Thank you very much, Mingi Rinpoche. And at this point, we are... Uh, coming to the conclusion of this evening, uh, or at least the first part. I think there will be a, a, s a film screening uh, after a half an hour break. But at this point, I would like to thank uh, Antoine, Marike and Minga Rinpoche for your wisdom, for your expertise, uh, and sharing it with all of uh, the people here present and also online. So thank you so much. <laughs> And uh, this thank you is on behalf of uh, Mind and Life Europe, uh, represented by Gabor uh, Kasai, the managing director of Mind and Life Europe, and from the board members here present from Tiger Meditation Community in Germany, and from uh, the team from Tiger International. And I know, as you can see, uh, you know the stage is prepared, but a lot of work goes into this, not just here present, but also in the background beforehand. And uh, both these associations are non-profit organizations, so any, any contributions, any support that you could give uh, uh, to these associations, always welcome, of course. And thank you so much for your, um, uh, for your time, taking it out uh, to come here, for your interest, for your questions. And we have a few more days of um, events with Minga Rinpoche, so uh, some of you we will uh, see again in the next few days, and those of you who uh, will depart to tonight, then I wish you a, a wonderful time. So thank you so much. Yeah, and wow, what an evening so far. We have 25 minutes, a short break, and then we see a wonderful film. And I just want to um, get on the words Holger Jesche was just saying about the coming events. Um, tomorrow another one is starting, a three-day event, so to say. I think you know about that. Um, if you don't have time, it's also a hybrid event, so you can also do it online. And on Monday and Tuesday, we have an in-person event here um, as well. 
take a look at our website, I think then, and I, I have the feeling you know what's, what's going on the next days, but it would really be nice to see you again for the next days. Um, and Holger Jesche also said something about if you want to donate something, there's one box out, outside. If you make a donation this evening, this donation goes, um, half of it goes to um, the producer of the film we want to see in 25 minutes, and the other half of it will go to Terga Germany, which, um, which tries to do this kind of events for many years so far, and we still, t of course, want to continue that. So if you donate today in this box, it's half to the... Um, producer to Paul. Paul, may, may you wave your hand again so we see you. Yeah, wonderful. In 20 minutes you're here for a short moment on the stage and then we can see this film. Yeah, and that's it from my side. Um, enjoy a short break and happy to see you back soon, otherwise for the next days and a wonderful evening. Thank you.